Good morning, everyone. Once again, I'd like to express my profound thanks to the elders here for the invitation to preach, for the opportunity to come and spend some time, me and my family, with the folks here. We certainly have appreciated it, appreciated seeing some new faces and also some familiar faces. We certainly appreciate this lectureship and appreciate all the work that goes into it. As was mentioned in the prayer, I know for the lectureship there are many things that have to be done before the lectureship starts and there are many who work behind the scenes and so we want to thank them as well for making it possible for us to be spiritually fed, to be encouraged, to, to be strengthened in the Lord. It is certainly pertinent, it is important for us to continue to do that, to continue to do the works that God has set before us. And so, this morning, I will be preaching, Choose He This Day. I want to tell Jeff, I just want you to note the time. Note that we did start late, so I want that time healed it back to me at the, at the very end. I can tell you right now, I'm going to need it. Choose He This Day. Text is taken from Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. And Joshua is addressing the nation of Israel. He is addressing the elders. He's addressing the officers. He's addressing the leaders. And it is at the culmination, or rather at the end, of a successful conquest. The children of Israel entered into the land, and they did those things which God required them to do. And they, uh, this was the conquest of Canaan. And uh, they destroyed their enemies. The land was, uh, was divided up. There were some things that happened in the midst of that that caused some issues and some problems. But what we have in Joshua 24 is the end, of that, uh, the end of that successful campaign, we might call it, where the children of Israel are going to their inheritance. Joshua will actually end this chapter and say, the children of Israel are going to their inheritance. They are going to settle, if you will. And so the children of Israel are on the verge of, they're entering in, they're in the promised land, they're in verge of uh, getting that inheritance about which the, uh, uh, God talked and promised, Joshua 24 and verse 8. And so what Joshua does, as he calls the, the children of Israel together, as he calls the elders together, as he calls the, all of these officers together, what he does is, in verses 1 through 4, he starts by talking about the providence of God. He goes all the way back to Terah, and he talks about uh, Abraham's father, and he talks about how God has promised to Abraham and let him out of us, and, and he recounts how God worked to, to bring about this nation, if you will. And he talks about the providence of God in verses 1 through 4, and then he moves on and he talks about the protection of God in verses 5 through 12. And he talks about how God has protected them even when they were in Egypt and the Egyptians came after them after God had sent the plagues and after Pharaoh tried to bargain with God as to whether the people could be released and they pursued the people uh, of God and, and God destroyed them behind them. And, and the Lord said, but not only that, also where you went, I, I, I defeated the enemies that were around you, those who did not have your best interest at heart. We look at the situation with Balak and how he tried to curse you through Balaam, and, and I helped you in that situation. So what, what Joshua is doing, he is recounting the protection of God, and how God has protected them so magnificently, and His providence has been uh, pre uh, prevalent in, here, in their lives. But then also in verse 13, he talks about the provision of God. He talks about how God provided for them, how God took care of them. And so all of these things that Joshua mentions at the very onset, is the grace of God. It is the grace of God uh, uh, given by God to the children of Israel. And so after enumerating God's grace, Joshua then issues a precept. He issues a precept, and this is where I want us to start this morning, with this precept that Joshua issues. Joshua 24 and verse 14, Joshua says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth put away the false gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve the Lord this is a precept this is a commandment this is what God desires from his people from Israel to now uh, to now it has always been what God wants from his people to fear him to serve him to have no other gods before them and to serve the God 
of heaven only. And make no mistake, God is not asking them a favor. God is not asking the children of Israel that, you know, if you have the time, or maybe you need to, to think about this, or I want you to, to, to fear me, you know. He's not asking them a favor. He's not asking them to, you know, if you have the time, whenever he says, this is a command, this is what God desires. And it is what God desires, generally speaking, for his entire creation. Solomon, after, you know, Solomon lost his mind, he did all sorts of crazy things. But he came to his senses, and we read that in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. You know, he finally came to his senses. When you read the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a lot of things Solomon did that were contrary to God. But Ecclesiastes is so the mind of, of Solomon being revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. It is an inspired book. The Lord reveals the mind of Solomon. And Solomon talks about all the things that he did. And there were a lot of foolish things in which he engaged. And he's trying to answer the question of life. He's trying to figure it all out. And the conclusion he came to is this. This is the conclusion of the whole matter of everything, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. That word duty supplied there in the King James translation of the Bible. But it is better rendered, this is the whole of man. This is man's all. This is what we have been created to do. We have been created to fear God and to keep His commandments. We've been created to serve God, to worship God. This is what man, all of mankind, is supposed to do. The psalmist would say in Psalm 18 and verse 3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. God, God of heaven, He is worthy to be praised. There is no one else who is worthy to receive our praises, who is worthy to receive our recognition of sovereignty. But then Revelation 4 and verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you have created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. He says the reason you receive glory, honor, and power is because you have created all things. You've made all things. Everything we have in this life is because of the grace of God. I want us to keep that in mind. But specifically here, Generally, everyone ought to serve the Lord, but specifically the children of Israel, as God issues this precept to them through his spokesman Joshua, they ought to be serving the Lord. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 3, And God spake to these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, and notice what he does, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. God says, I am the Lord your God who has done all of these things for you, just like he did for us, just like he provided for us. I've done all of these things for you. I want you to serve me and no other God. We have a choice, brethren. A choice is always in front of us. We have a choice to serve God the way we ought to or serve something else. The choice is always before man and the choice has always been there for everyone. You know, sometimes folks try to do both. Sometimes individuals, and just this morning, let's talk about the body of Christ. Let's not venture out into the world because they need to know Jesus before they can serve Him and they don't know Him. But we do, and sometimes what happens is we try to do both. We try to serve God while at the same time working in the world as well. Maybe I can do both. Maybe I can serve God and serve in the world as well. And there's a problem with this. The first problem is that it's irreverent. It is irreverent to attempt to do such a thing. God predicated the worthiness of His service to Him based on the wealth of His grace. On the wealth of His grace. Remember, I said, or you need to keep in mind the Lord when He talked about why it is that, that He ought to be served in Revelation 4 and verse 11, Thou art worthy, why? For you have created all of these things. He's worthy because of what He's done. But this is not the first time that he says this. You look at creation, when you read Genesis chapter 1, what is it? It's telling us about God. It is telling us about what God has done. It is telling about who He is and what He has done in His magnificent power. And we can read the book of Genesis and we can know exactly that we are here, that we have life and breath in our lungs because of God. That everything you see around you, the beauty of this world, has been created by God. And so we know that we can serve Him. We know that He is worthy of service and worthy of veneration because of creation. But then also when you look at the emancipation of, of Israel, when you look at how God freed them, when God set forth His Decalogue, when He set forth those Ten Commandments, how did the Lord start it? 
He said, I am the God of your forefathers, and this is what I've done. And so he starts, first of all, by telling them who he is and what he has done. And then based upon that, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. But then also in salvation. In salvation, the same principle is set forth. The same thinking God, He wants us to be saved, and He has commandments for us to follow so that we can be saved through His Son, Jesus the Christ. But what does He do? He tells us what He did for us. He says He sent His only begotten Son so that we might live. God has always moved first. God has always provided grace first. We don't move first. Sometimes we say you, we found God as if He was the one who was lost. God's not the one who was lost. We were lost and He came seeking us. And He is the one who moves first. And so the Creator and the Sustainer, the Provider and Protector, the Redeemer of your life is then supposed to share a stage with something or someone else. Is that even fair? No, it's not. God said, the reason you need to serve me is because I've provided all of you uh, these things. And then we want to put Him on par with everything else that He provided us. How foolish is that? We want to put Him on par with the stuff that we have in this life. We want worldly things to be on the same stage. We want to share that relationship. Jeremiah, in pointing out the foolishness of idolatry, said in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 5, recorded, they are upright. These idols, they are upright as a palm tree, but they cannot speak. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them. Focus on this, for they cannot do evil, neither can they do any good. Brethren, he says they can't do anything. They cannot provide for you anything. They cannot give you anything. They may have asked their idols, what have you done for me lately? And the answer would have been nothing. Nothing. And so how irreverent is it, if you will, to, to serve this thing, to serve things in the world, to serve, uh, to serve our, our, our pleasures and to serve our, our sometimes sinful desires above that of God. It's irreverent. Why? Because He's the one who gave us everything. Imagine, if you will, if you've provided and you've taken care and you have protected and you have sustained and then someone, that person to whom you've done all of these things, turns around. And then gives their affection to someone else. You, you, you'd be a little bit upset about that, wouldn't you? You'd be a little bit put out by that. You would think to yourself, look at all that I've done and look at how you are treat, treating me. It's not that you've just walked away from me. You're turning against me because that's what it is when we try to do both. The psalmist said in Psalm 29 and verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory that is due His name. He deserves it. And it is irreverent to give ourselves to anything else. But not only is it irreverent, we have to understand as we, we make this choice, as the choice is in front of us, we can't choose both. Why? Because it's impossible. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. If you are trying to balance God and this world, one of them will be neglected. One of them will be neglected. Ideally, if you choose God, the world will be neglected. That's what's supposed to happen. You are supposed to choose God, and the world should be neglected. The sinful things of this world, the unrighteous things of this world, ought to be neglected, and that's how it's supposed to work. But so many times, when we try to do both, when we say we want God, but at the same time we want the world as well, God is the one who gets neglected. He's the one who gets put on the back burner, if you will. When we put our desires first, and sometimes it is not even uh, inherently sinful. Sometimes it is not even things that are inherently sinful, but it becomes sinful because we put it in front of God. Worldliness is contrary to godliness. It is impossible to choose God and this world. Israel had to make a choice. Israel has given a precept. Here, choose the Lord. Serve Him in sincerity, and that choice is certainly in front of us as well. But consider also, Joshua then asked them for their preference. Joshua asked them for their preference. He gives them a precept, and then he asked them for their preference. The righteous God of heaven will not impede the free moral agency of his creation. Is it needful for them to serve the, uh, the, the God of heaven? Absolutely it's needful for them. Not only in a spiritual sense or in a salvific sense, but also because if they don't serve the God of heaven, they're going to die. 
So it is very needful for them to serve the God of heaven. But then also we understand it's it's advantageous for them. If they serve the God of heaven, they're going to be blessed. The book of Deuteronomy points this out, that they're going to be blessed. But yet still the God of heaven will not impede rather their free moral agency. In order to protect the sanctity of freedom, choice is always involved when it comes to God. And so this is what Joshua asked them. And if it seem evil unto you to serve The Lord choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The precept to serve the Lord in sincerity cannot be fulfilled in the absence of free will. Let me say that again. The precept of serving the Lord in sincerity with a pure and honest heart cannot be fulfilled in the absence of free will. Any service rendered to God that is involuntary cannot be done in sincerity. This has to be their choice. This choice must be or proceed from a willing heart. There has never been a time when God superimposed His will upon man's free will. There's never been a time. You go back to the garden, you, you, got, you have God placing the, the tree of life in the garden, and God t- tells them what? He says, do not eat of the fruit of the tree which grows in the midst of the garden. Did God somehow keep them from that? Did God somehow cause Adam and Eve to to have a different mind, if you will? No. They were free. They were free to make that choice. They were made in the image of God, and so they had free will. The choice has always been man's, and God says, I want you to choose right. I want you to choose that which is righteous. You know, inevitably when I teach about the fall in the garden, the question will arise, well, why did God give us free will? You know, why didn't He just make us so that we didn't have to to choose and just follow Him? And what this question, even though it is sincere, coming well from some well-meaning individual, it not only is questioning the wisdom of God and creation and how He created us, but also it is demeaning the essence of free will. It's because what free will allows us to do is to reciprocate love. Free will allows us to reciprocate the love that God has given for us. I appreciate so much godly men and women who have chosen to give their lives to the Lord. I appreciate young families and older families and and families in the Lord. You're here this morning. You've chosen to be here. I appreciate it. Why? Because you made that choice. No one forced you, hopefully. No one coerced you. You made the choice to serve the Lord. You made the choice to hear the word of the Lord. We are not programmed to love God. We choose to return the love He has for us in kind. And this is how God desires it to be. And free will makes that possible. Freedom of choice makes that possible. How could Israel serve Him in sincerity without Him giving them a choice? Without Him being able to to give or without them being able to choose in the matter. There is no sincerity where there is no choice. Imagine, if you will, if you had the ability to make some kind of android, some kind of robot with complete human features, and you decide to yourself that this robot or whatever is going to be your life partner, if you will, is going to be your friend or whatever the case may be, and you program it to say whatever you want it to say, and you go on long walks on the beach together, and it looks just like a human, and, and, and you, you walk in the park together, and you hold hands, and this thing looks you deep in the eye, and this thing utters the words to you, I love you. And you go, wow, that makes me feel good, only for a certain time, until you realize what? It's only saying that because you programmed it to. It doesn't really love you. You change the programming, the algorithm, it go down the street and love someone else. And so we see in the absence of choice here, that is what it would be with, without free will, nothing more than programmed flesh and bone. That's what we would be, and that's what the service of Israel would be if they did not have a choice in the matter. And so we understand that free will proves that, or rather, uh, will allow us to reciprocate love, but also the free will proves that we reverence the Lord. You know, when Satan asked if he uh, was as considered God's servant, Job, Job chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, so Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Does Job fear God for naught? Have you not made a hedge around about him? What Satan is saying is, listen, God, if you, if you take away all of his blessings, I guarantee you he's going to drop you. 
I guarantee you that he is going to turn his back on you. How do you know Satan is not omniscient? Because he was dead wrong. He was dead wrong here. You know, and it's interesting that he is wrong here, but he comes back. He comes back and says, well, I guarantee you, if you allow me to touch him, wait a second, you were wrong in the first instance. But you see, he's not trying to be right here. He's trying to, to prove a point here. He's trying to destroy here. That is his way. But consider this. The reason Job is living righteously, he says, is because God's been protecting him. If God made man without free will, Satan could approach God with the same type of argument. They don't reverence you because they want to. They reverence you because they were made to. And what would God say to that? If Satan approached God and says, listen, these people here at 39th Street, they don't love you. They don't want to serve you, but they are there because, well, that's how you program them. They don't have a choice. You are operating on them directly, we might say. There's a direct operation of the Holy Spirit miraculously making sure that these people do what they're supposed to do. What could God say? Nothing. Satan would have a case against the Almighty God. How absolutely terrible to think that. But God, we think that we have the ability to choose. With free will, there can be no accusation against God and no condemnation of His people. God could say, they serve me because they want to, not because they have to. Israel, here is your choice. This is your choice. This decision is made abundantly obvious if you listen to what is being said. He says you, can have, you have the choice to serve the gods of, uh, that were on the other side of the river or the flood. And he mentions this in, in verse 5, I believe it is. He mentions, you know, Terah and he mentions Abraham. He says, remember the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. They abandoned those gods and served the true and only living God. That's what they did. So you have a choice here. You can serve the same gods which your forefathers abandoned. That seems rather foolish. Let's, let's pick up these abandoned gods, if you will. Imagine you're walking past a dumpster and you see there a little idol in it and you decide, I'm going to pick this idol up, clean it off, and I'm going to serve it. That's essentially what he's saying. That's foolishness. But also you can serve the gods of the Amorites which, uh, which were not able to protect them. And here you are in their land. You've taken their land and you want to serve their god, which they actually did. Later on, they would actually do that foolish thing. They would serve the very gods who could not protect the people in his land they were. Foolishness. Joshua says you need to make a choice, but this choice, this choice is abundantly clear. The God of heaven is the only right choice you can make. The, any other choice than serving anything else is a foolish choice. And it's a choice for us as well. When we don't choose God, there's only foolishness left. Joshua reveals his decision. He says, me and my house will serve the Lord. I cannot make this choice for you. I cannot force this upon you. But what I can do is lead by example. And this is exactly what this man has done from the very beginning. You know, this is Moses' apprentice. Joshua just didn't, didn't just fall out of the sky. Leaders are not born, if you will. You say, this was a born leader. Well, no. Joshua was made leader. He is with Moses up there when he receives the Decalogue. He's right there alongside Moses. He's been primed for leadership for a long time. And so Joshua, when Moses passes away, he, he does not go into the promised land. Who will lead for us? Joshua will. Why? Because God's been planning this. Nothing takes God by surprise. And so this great man, Joshua, he's done some great things. You read the book of Joshua and just look at everything that they've done. And, and he's a leader. So, so, much, uh, so many lessons that can be learned by Joshua as he takes the people, you know, he takes over from Moses and those some big shoes to fill. The lawgiver of Israel. He takes over from him and he leads the people into the promised land. And now the Bible says here he is at his old age. He's at his old age, brethren. And the statement that he makes here is not a statement of a young man or perhaps we might say a new convert in saying me and my house will follow the Lord. This is an older man who has been serving the Lord and he is essentially saying me and my house will continue to serve the Lord. You do whatever you are going to do. You have preference in that. Remember the consequences. He's going to tell them here in the bit. But we're going to serve the Lord. That's what we're going to do. And that's the choice that's certainly in front of us as well. We need to choose while Joshua chose. And we need to say we're going to continue to serve the Lord. It doesn't matter what the world does. 
It doesn't matter what anybody else out there does. It, even, it doesn't even matter what the congregation does. That's why we are converted to Christ and not converted to His church. You see, because when those who are members of the body of Christ decide to lose their minds and walk away from Christ, I'm not walking after them. I'm staying with Christ. You can lose your mind. I'm staying here. I'm following the Lord. We can only follow those as long as they are following Christ. And so, Christian, you have a choice to serve God or not. The choice is yours. It always will be. People may influence you one way or the other. But because it's yours, you bear full responsibility for it. You own it. You own the consequences, good or bad. The reason every man is accountable for his own sins is because every man has the ability to choose not to sin. That's the reason you are accountable for sin in your life. That's the reason we cannot point fingers at anyone else. That's the reason we will stand before God, before Jesus the Christ in judgment, and we will be judged alone. We will be judged on what we have done. There is no group rate on judgment. It's not the case that you can come and say, well, I was with those folks at 39th Street. You know, they did a lot of good things, and I was with them. I was right there. I was in the back, you know. No offense to those sitting in the back. <laughs> You know, I was, I was there, and, and yeah, did I engage in anything? No, I didn't really do anything. You know, did I really participate? Did I support? No, I really didn't do anything, but I was there. I was with them. There's no such thing as judgment. What did you do? You had the free will. You had the ability to choose, and so therefore you are responsible for the decisions that you make. Here's a precept. You need to make a choice. You need to choose to serve the Lord. That's the precept. You need to serve God. You need to serve Him in sincerity with a pure heart because you want to. And so He says, what is your preference? And we have then in verses 16 and 17 the proclamation of the people. Notice what they say in Joshua 24, verses 16 through 17. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, He is the one that brought us up. And our fathers out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went, and among all the people through whom we passed, and the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for He is our God. This is great. This is great. Everyone is on the same page. Joshua says he and his house is going to serve the Lord. The people turn around and says, listen, God has done some great things for us. We too are going to serve the Lord. The land has been conquered. The people are cooperating and God is glorified. Amen. Oh, you wish you could see that in the body as well. Everybody cooperating. Just imagine what we could do if we cooperated. If we work together. Just think a host of congregations in a, in, a, in a certain area working together for the cause of God. Unstoppable. You know, we're stronger together. We're stronger when we work together, when we encourage one another, when we understand there are those who have not bowed their knee to Baal. And as we continue to do the will and work of the Lord, it is a beautiful thing to work together. But we have to understand here that they've been here before, not with great success. Numbers chapter 13 and 14 is recorded for us. The people's rebellion, they failed to take the land because of their unbelief. They chose fear over faith. They chose to cower and run back to Egypt instead of conquering the land that was already theirs. God didn't tell them to go spy out the land to see whether you could take it. He was just saying, go check it out. It's great. And they went and they checked it out and they came back as if they were supposed to fight these people without God's aid. And they cowered. But this is a much different picture here in Joshua chapter 24. It's a much different picture here than those individuals who said, let's return back to Egypt. And the reason it is a much different picture is because this is a different generation. It's not the same people. Joshua chapter 5 tells us this. Israel is composed of a new generation. The old faithless generation died in the wilderness per the judgment of God. This generation has been 40 years in the making. They are picking up where their ancestors failed. We are going to be better. We are going to do better. That's what we're going to do. Is there anything more beautiful than Christians saying, we will serve the Lord? Is there anything more encouraging to a preacher than to hear them saying, listen, we know what's happening, but we're going to serve the Lord. False teacher comes in, no, nope, we're going to serve the Lord. 
We're going to serve the Lord. You know, someone told me this. I think it was Brother John DeBerry. He told me this a while back. He said, you know, we talked about some false teacher coming into the congregation and almost splitting the congregation. He says, you know why the false teacher was able to split the congregation? Because the brethren allowed it. Because they allowed it. You know, if we don't allow false teachers to preach their false doctrine, if we kick them out of the Lord's church, not out of the Lord's church, if we kick them out of our congregations the way God says to, mark them and avoid them, don't give them the pulpit, you know, they stop that nonsense. If they know they can come, can't come through the door and just persuade everyone and say, listen, you can't get up there and preach that nonsense. We're going to send you on your way. If they start realizing that, they're not going to come to your congregation. But what happens so many times is we know this guy is preaching false doctrine. We sit there, well, I don't agree with that, but we don't say anything. How beautiful is it for us to say, no, we're going to serve the Lord. God has been good to us. Sin in the camp. What are we going to do? Ignore it? Sweep it under the rug? No, we're going to serve the Lord. Trials of life wearing you out, and you're thinking about quitting, you stand up and you say, no, we're going to serve the Lord. He's been good to us. Persecution on the rise, what are we going to do? Cower and run back to Egypt? Proverbially speaking, no, we're going to serve the Lord. That's what we ought to do. The same thing as they said, they're going to serve the Lord. But then Joshua, as he gives them this precept and he says it's their preference and and they make the proclamation and say hey, listen we're going to serve the lord joshua says hold up a second i need you to process this choice this is interesting i need you to process this choice joshua 24 verses 19 through 22 and joshua said unto the people you cannot serve the lord wait a second joshua we just told you we would what are you talking about why because the lord is holy is a jealous god he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods. Then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done good to you. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Here's that accountability. He says, You are witnesses. You've chosen for yourselves. Joshua says, I need you to back up just a little bit. I need you to process this. If you go back on this covenant, the mighty God will destroy you. And you think about that. If you go back on this covenant, God, who is now your protector and provider, will become your destroyer. This is a serious decision. You don't trifle with the God of heaven. This is a serious decision. It's a serious decision that is before them. This is a lifelong commitment. The Lord is working through them to bring about the Christ. This is the nation of Israel. God is, this is a lifelong commitment. It is not, we're going to go into the land, serve God for a couple of years, and then we'll see, we'll evaluate, we'll assess after that. This is a lifelong commitment. If you don't do what God said to do, He will destroy you. There's no two ways about it. This is a life and death decision. Deuteronomy 8, verse 19 and 20, Then it shall be if you by any means forget the Lord and follow other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day. The Lord says, Hear me. Hear me. You shall surely perish. It's going to happen. Does God want to destroy them? No. Does God uh, get joy or pleasure in destroying anyone? No. Does He have any pleasure that the wicked die? He says, No. He says, as the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so shall you perish, because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord. You need to make a choice, but you need to understand that there are consequences here. This is a serious choice. You say very easily, yes, we will serve the Lord, but you need to think about the consequences. Here's a question for us. Did someone warn you about your choice to become a Christian? And when you study with others, did you warn them? We don't do that, do we? We don't warn people about becoming a Christian, but don't you know that Jesus did that? In Luke chapter 14, verses 25 and following, the Lord, what He did as He is on His way to Jerusalem, great multitudes were following Him, and He turned around and said to them, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate father or mother, wife or children, brothers or sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. You know, the family is cherished by God, loved by God. It's his creation. However, the family whose members are so close and personal cannot come before God. And even though I love my family, even though God loves my family, my love for, for him should always reign supreme. And so God turns around, and they want to be his disciples. He says, just like Joshua, I need you to process this. When you follow me, the chances are you may have to go up against your own family members. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You see, that decision ought not to be made in the moment. Because in the moment... We are wrapped up in our emotions. We're wrapped up in that, that relationship, if you will. In that moment, we will or could make the wrong decision. Hopefully not. That decision is made when you enter into the Lord and the Lord said, you're going to put me first and I make the decision. I'm going to put God first. But what if my wife decides she's going to leave God? Well, she can leave God. I'm not. What if my husband decides he's going to leave God? Well, he can leave God. I'm not. What if my children leave God? They can leave God. I'm not. I love them, won't change. Try to get them back, that won't change. But they're on their own. God says you need to think about that. He gives another example. He warns and says this is preventative. For the sake of time, I won't take the time to read it. Luke chapter 14, 28 through 33. He says this is preventative for which of you intending to build a tower. He talks about an individual who builds a tower. He talks about an individual who sits down, uh, a king who goes to war. And what Jesus is trying to prevent us from entering into this walk of faith with is uh, he's trying to prevent us entering in with our minds closed to reality he says this is going to be difficult this is going to be hard and he says the lord wants to prevent us from having peace talks with satan he talks about the king that he's going to war and somebody comes along and oh they've got a bigger army i need to i i need to go have peace talks with these guys they're going to overrun us he's trying to prevent us from doing that Satan is attacking us from left and right. And now you start thinking, well, you know, the world is not, is not really that bad. It's not really that, that terrible. Maybe, just maybe we can acquiesce and maybe we can give up a couple of things. Maybe we can say we're not going to be as forceful in preaching the gospel. Maybe we can back off a little bit of things. Preacher, you really don't have to speak out against certain things just to appease the people a little bit. The peace talks with Satan is what that is. So consider the Lord says, I don't want you, I don't want you to do this. The Christian life is the abundant life. There is no better life. There's no better life. I always say I came out of Catholicism. I've been there, done that, been in the world, lived in the world. Trust me, there's nothing back there. There's nothing back there. This is the good life. But we would be remiss if we preach or teach or believe that it won't be difficult. The Lord is just asking us to think about what we're doing. This is not a choice between Walmart and Target. You know, this is a lifelong commitment to the God of heaven. And we need to talk to our young people when they enter into the Lord. That's why I always say we need to get away from this infant baptism. Some of these kids, brethren, they don't know what they're getting into. They don't know what the responsibilities of Christianity is and how could they possibly make an informed decision as the Lord asks His disciples to do. Make an informed decision. Everyone who obeys the gospel needs to know what they're getting into. Why? Because this also is a life and death decision. Just like for Israel, it's a life and death decision. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 and 31. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, he talks about those who are forsaking the Lord. They're going back into Judaism. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse or sore punishment do you suppose? Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge His people. Notice this. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Oftentimes when that is preached, we're talking about the world and we're saying they need to understand it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is written to Christians. 
and the vengeance of God will be rained down upon Christians who trample underfoot the Son of God. Christians, those who have obeyed the gospel, and then they committed themselves to God, to living God, and then they decide, no, we're going to go to the world. That's why the Lord says, you need to think about this. You need to process this decision. Because when you make the choice, there are consequences. You can have the great and wonderful spiritual blessings of God, or you can have the consumer, the destroyer, come after you. You don't want that. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Joshua says, you are witnesses against yourself. If you go off into idolatry, which they did, this testimony, you saying that you will serve the Lord, you saying, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that good confession will come back and will speak against you. We made a choice. We confess the good name of Christ and we willingly entered into a covenant relationship with the Lord. If we choose to leave the Lord, our own confession will be used against us. Israel, see the providence of the Lord. See His provision and His protection that He has provided for you. Therefore, take this precept, serve the Lord. Declare your preference. What will you do? The people proclaim, yes, we will serve the Lord. But you need to process this decision. There are consequences. And they decided they're going to follow the Lord. And they went to their inheritance. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. But as for the Stephanus household, we're going to serve the Lord. Thank you.